Right, I'm very unaccustomed to public speaking. The first and last time was several years ago. It was my wedding. That's slightly different. It was obviously a lot more joyous affair. And I've been volunteered to do this. So slightly nervous, so please bear with me. Um, it, it was actually part of, it was part of my selection procedure was to a presentation with 10 minutes notice. The, the one thing I didn't notice was that the, the screens were all jumbled up on the uh, PowerPoint and I went to pieces in that. But uh, luckily the other two chaps there for the final selection even went to, were even worse than I was. So uh, here I am being volunteered for this. But, uh, so my name is Tim Maynard. I'm the regional manager of the newly opened Bristol office. It's, uh, I've got the keys. At the moment I've got a pasting table and a kitchen chair, my laptop and that's it. But... Everything is on its way, so I'm, I am open for business in Bristol. Um, I've been asked to tell you about Camelot and how we can minimize risks with your vacant properties and also um, show you opportunities how we can generate income for you. Um, first of all, I want to tell you a bit about uh, Camelot. The first thing I must note is Bristol is there, for those people who don't know it. So we do have more officers than that. We were established in the Netherlands in 1993, and almost 10 years ago today, we came to the UK. Uh, 17 offices in six countries and six offices in the UK, head office in London, our Midlands office in Birmingham, Northern office, Manchester, Scotland office in Glasgow, Dublin, and of course, the, the best office is in Bristol. It'll be the, it'll be the, the leading one, I've got no doubt. Um, our 2011 turnover was in excess of 16 million pounds, and the way we're going this year will be exceeding that by at least 25%. Um, over 200 employees throughout the UK, that's increasing all the time. I'm recruiting in Bristol at the moment, so we will have, well, 203 very quickly, and hopefully a lot more throughout the region. And we are market leaders in Europe for, for what we do, the living guardians, the vacant property protection. Um, we've got six main product groups. Our niche product, and one we're probably best known for, are the living guardians, placing temporary guardians um, into your properties as occupiers during periods of vacancy. Management and maintenance, we've got an extremely successful and experienced facilities management team in London who can look after all those issues. Now, make space pay and workspace. We have Rosemary Hammond with us today sitting in the front row who will be doing more um, of a talk on that. And this is where we can generate income for you for your properties in partnership with ourselves. Uh, traditional security, we can offer the traditional security, i.e. manned guards, dog patrols, alarms. Obviously, lots of people do that. Um, ho well, we can certainly uh, we get the buying power to get better rates for you. We want to get a bit more of that later on in the presentation. And insurance solution, we do have our own bespoke insurance that we can help you out with that. Thank you, Bob. Now, quality standards, we were the first living guardian company to achieve the British standards ISO for, for our key holding garden vetting aspects of our service. Uh, we've also been granted SIA accreditation across the board, company-wide accreditation, and all the frontline staff, including myself, have sat through um, all the training required um, to offer, well, certainly on, the, on property protection. Um, in Holland, we worked together with the Dutch government to... Um, put together standards on the Living Guardian solution, and that was made law in 2010, by which time we had already received our kite mark for that. And these policies we've rolled out across Europe, and especially in the UK, we've got very strict guidelines, very high expectations of us, um, which has been borne out from the Dutch um, negotiations with the government and obviously their standards. Thank you, Bob. Now, the risks of a vacant property, be it a, an office block like this, a school, a care home, a residential property, et cetera, et cetera, um, the ones we'll know about are the most serious, probably squatting, theft, vandalism, and fly tipping. There are others which I will subdivide for you. Uh, I need my little uh, crib notes here. The criminal risks, we all hear about metal theft and lead disappearing off roofs, um, theft from inside as well, boilers, radiators, um, and also, we've certainly seen, we've been to properties where commercial kitchens have disappeared overnight, and that's a, an awful lot of money. Um, the vandalism, graffiti, fly tipping you'll know about. In the southwest, I have a trouble with travellers. I'm sure by, um, the other regional managers have the same problems, but uh, in the southwest, they seem to park their caravans wherever they want to, and uh, that's certainly a problem. Illegal raves, not so much heard about these days, but I understand in London they do have a, a problem with that. And the biggest problem we all have is squatting. In Bristol, it seems to be a, a centre of squatting. I'm sure parts of London are exactly the same. 
and uh, we are forever trying to outsmart them. Um, now, a case study in Amsterdam, the city council owned an iconic building on the city waterfront. It used to be the Shell headquarters. And when Shell vacated in 2011, um, it very quickly be became squatted. And uh, what we found when we finally went in there was not only metal theft, drugs, there was prostitution, um, illegal immigrants, uh, bike theft. There were hundreds of bikes all over the place, but um, um, bike theft from apparently it happens in this country as well. I've yet to see it, but apparently it does. And in February this year, we formed a partnership between the city council, ourselves, and also the police. They call it the military police over in Holland, but they're no different to our police with riot training and an eviction took place. Um, the property was immediately handed over to us for further well, for, for ongoing management. The first thing we did was put 24-hour, 24-7 guarding, that's the right words, as well as dog patrols to preserve security. And then the clean-up started. Um, not only cleaning up all the, the drugs and everything else and all the, the theft and cleaning the property from all the graffiti, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it was also reinstating boilers and making the property live once again so we could actually put it back into, into other use. And now it's a thriving center um, of community. We've got workshops, um, office space. There's a, a music studio, photographic. Uh, it is a thriving thing w which we are very proud of. And city council were very pleased they placed their trust in us because they've got rid of a huge problem. Um, Technical risk, water leaks, be it a burst pipe um, in the winter or a small leak, if they left um, unattended, can very, become, uh, can very quickly become big problems. Um, fire due to um, uh, electrical faults. And the dilapidation cause, the, 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 the loss in value caused by the overdue maintenance is obviously a big problem. Now, we, um, our living guardians not only help being our eyes and ears, um, they report the small faults. And going back to the criminal risk as well, they report any, any threats of um, squatting, any vandalism, any break-ins. Um, because they're living there, they're there, um, not all the time, but uh, they're certainly there um, to, to give us reports. Thank you, Bob. Um, economic risk. When a property becomes empty... Um, Insurance companies do want to know about it. They, uh, they'll put um, onerous terms on the uh, insurance. They'll also raise premiums. And it's quite often only the times when you make a claim do you realize you're uninsured, maybe not even insured. Um, and the depreciation, the loss in value by broken windows, vandalism. Um, first of all, if you try and sell the property or you let it to tenants, the last thing they're going to want to do is to buy it. Well, certainly not the price you want. And um, your chance of you getting a good tenant in quickly are, are severely compromised. Um, now, my background many years ago was, was with house building. And um, certainly, if we had a squatted property, we certainly could not predict where we were going to start development. So that's part of the cash flow planning. Um, and the first thing you can do is you need to get rid of the squatters. And then you can actually know when you can start development. And the whole planning process, the development process will be put back, which has got costly implications. Now, um, oh, sorry, hang on, hang on. The empty business rates, we have a, a Mark Higgin from uh, Montague Evans a little bit later on. He'll be giving, he's an expert on business rates, and you can certainly talk about it a lot more eloquently than I can. So I'll leave that to him. Um, the social risk, an empty property in a neighborhood quickly becomes a magnet for troublemakers. Starts with teenage kids, a um, bit of graffiti here and there. It can end up being like a city property in Amsterdam, a complete center um, for criminal activity. And this lost, lost sense of community, um, obviously having this uh, sort of cancer, cancer in the middle of the community, can um, make the area spiral downwards. Now, in New York in 1980, a social law came out, which um, the it's all about... You, Showing a property on a scale of one to five, where no, three is neither good nor bad, uh, number, five, number one is bad and five is good. And with a property going into misuse, um, it can very quickly go to um, two, it can very quickly go to one. 
and obviously with Living Guardians and the proactive management that we, that we put in place, uh, it will stop the rot and very quickly, once a property is developed, sold, let, that area will improve and it will attract further investment. So that's the New York social law, which I've been revising about. Now, what can Camelot offer you? Every property is unique, not every problem is unique. And over the 20 years and 10 years in the UK, we've probably seen most problems that uh, before vacant properties. But uh, we're able to offer you tailored advice and a bespoke solution. We've got six product groups, this toolbox, and we can either pick one, two, or three products, or whatever, how many products we need um, to, to help you in this. Um, the range of solutions um, to stop the property falling into disrepair, falling into squatters' hands, um, etc. So, well, are you ready? Thank you. Living Guardians, this is our niche product, and this is the, uh, the one that, we, uh, that we're best known for. Placing key workers as temporary occupants in your vacant property. The guardians are fully vetted. They, we take up exhaustive references for them. Um, they live in the property as they do their own home. There are eyes and ears. And because they're there, um, they're stopping squatters getting and stopping um, all, all the, sort of the criminal acts vandalism. It's a quick solution. Quite often, if we see a property today... Um, chances are by tonight we could have guardians living in the property or certainly within 24 hours it is a very quick solution and there are cost savings um, over the traditional forms of security Thank you, Bob. now facilities management we do have uh, an experienced team in London who are responsible for all aspects of this from um, sort of fire alarm monitoring um, Go, um, ground maintenance, cleaning, etc. Now we do have Darren Suku, who is in the second row, the right, the very end, who is available. He's our facilities manager, and who will be available during the day, taking any questions from you. Now, make space pay. Um, Rosemary in the front row will be doing a speech later on. Stand up, Rosemary. <laughs> wave. Thank you. That's right. Rosemary will be telling us how we can gain, uh, we can generate income for your property in partnership with ourselves. Now. Many properties, say so properties are unique, uh, a lot of them have further users or uses. The property there has got uh, an advertising wrap on the outside. That generates income from you, for you, not from you, for you. And uh, whether it's um, film shoots inside, parking, storage, uh, one or photo shoots, there is an income to be derived from that. So that's, once again, Rosemary and also Workspace um, Rosemary will be touching more onto this, but this offers flexible office space. So if we take over an office building, one option is to put living guardians in, or maybe living guardians as well as um, a workspace solution whereby we offer flexible office space um, for startups or small companies. It's an affordable option for them rather than signing up to big leases, or um, which is obviously an expensive option. Um, once again, generate in, in, income for you and offset empty business rates. Mark Higgin will be touching on that later on. Thank you, Bob. Um, traditional security, we all know, 24-hour, 7 guarding. Um, we have a buying power, so we can certainly save you money on your existing providers. Um, so alarms and Cytex, um, all the traditional forms. Um, Camelot Property Insurance. Tokyo Marine, it is spelled correctly, T-O-K-I-O, are in the top five of the, the world's underwriters. We have a scheme un, underwritten for them uh, for properties or portfolios in excess of £5 million. Pounds. Now, that's a, a wide cover. Um, there's no un unnecessary security measures or onerous terms, and there, we do offer competitive premiums. Thank you, Bob. Now, the Camelot solution is effective. It's a comprehensive solution. It's also an easy solution as well. I'll run into why it's easy, why it's effective. It's all economic. There's some clear financial benefits. Um, it's effective. The property is in permanent use, be it living guardians who are living in the property, going to and from the property, vehicle movements, people movements, lights on in property. It shows passers-by who are either there for genuine reasons or for the people who are wanting to get into the property or cause damage that the property is in use. Now, that's an important point to make. Your property and my property today are probably empty. We're all at school or we're all at work or we're at school. 
And a squatter going into that property creates a, is, is a criminal act. And the first thing you do, you phone the police, the police come straight down and hoik them out. It's a criminal offence. Now, if that property is empty and you have got no further use of the property, be it a school or church or office, and the squatters get in, it's a civil offence. And that's up to you, the owners or property managers, to get them out through the courts. And that costs lots of money and takes lots of time. Um, Camelot guardians, whoever they are, set up home in the property on a temporary basis. They're there under licence. There's no tenancy created whatsoever. Um, they're there under very strict rules. But it's still their home. They set it up as their home. Um, you get scruffy guardians. You get those who treat their properties like palaces. Um, and there are eyes and ears there for us to report any small problems. Thank you, Bob. It's an easy solution as well. It's totally flexible. Um, if you want the property back, you give us three weeks' notice. We wait a week, and we give the guardians two, week not two weeks' notice. So that um, when you want your property back, we know it's been fully occupied and protected up until the time you get the keys. I've been on a couple of handbacks already when I was training in London, and literally the guardians are leaving with their suitcases, the remains of their belongings, and the agent or the owner's there. Here are your keys. Thank you very much. Um, permanent access for your agents, for yourself, for your surveyors, for prospective buyers or prospective tenants. All we ask is for 24 hours notice. We can make sure, therefore, that's a key holder in attendance, either ourselves or, or one of the guardians. We also inspect the property monthly. I have a property inspector in Bristol. Dan, who will go and inspect each property, and each office has a property inspector. I believe there's two or three in London. They've got a lot of work, a lot of business. And you will get an email into your inbox once a month, either saying the property is fine and dandy, or we've got some concerns. And not only are there concerns, this is what we would suggest we do about it. If it is serious, and obviously we're straight on the phone, we don't wait for the, the monthly email to arrive. And guardians who, who are living in the property who find any faults, there's a 24-hour helpline. And um, any small instance, if it's a serious one, then we have a network of uh, contractors around the country who will be straight there, broken windows, boarding, or whatever it is, burst pipes, they're there straight away. Anything which is not serious, we obviously wait to speak to you. If it's a matter of a fence down or whatever, then we'll speak to you the next day and get your authorization, or maybe you've got your own maintenance crew in the, in the region that can do the work for you. Thank you, Bob. It's the economic solution as well. The permanent protection is far less than the cost of conventional security methods. In Bristol, one of my clients, Stuart, had a property. It's right in the heart of Bristol. It's a red light district. It's uh, lots of squatters' properties in the neighbourhood. He was paying £5,000 a month for 24-hour seven guarding. Um, thank you. That's not the property, but he's now paying about £75 a week. He paid a small set-up charge as well, um, so that's a huge saving. And he's also benefiting from low insurance premiums. He's his, por his portfolio um, through our insurance. So it is a win-win situation, certainly for him, and we are effectively um, managing his property. He's saving an awful lot of money. Thank you, Bob. Other savings other than insurance costs... Inspections. If you have a vacant property, either you or a member of your staff are probably inspecting it in a weekly basis if it's in a high-risk area. You're probably doing it on the way into work, on the way home from work. I did it in my previous careers, looking after empty properties. Uh, we take that from you. Living gardens are there. Those are your eyes and ears. Um, Third-party visits. If your surveyor wants to go and do an inspection, your agent wants to show a tenant or prospective tenant to prospective buyer, or even the gas man wants to read the meter. At the moment, you're probably having to send one of your staff out or you yourself to open, open the doors. Um, our guardians live in the property. They're there. Once again, we ask you for a bit of notice, which we all generally get from the, the agents, um, so that we can make sure that they're definitely there, that they definitely know what's expected of them, and the areas, either meter boxes are unlocked or, or whatever. Empty business rates. Mark Higgin will be talking about this later on. And above all, we save you time. We save you the angst as well of worrying about your property. Uh, we're marketing, sorry, we're managing the property for you. And when you hand us your keys, you're handing us your trust as well. 
There you go. Right, I'm glad to say my comments earlier on have been recognized, and there's the Bristol office. So uh, I look forward to... <laughs> it was actually a genuine mistake in the first time we picked up during the, uh, the preparation. But uh, we are open for business. I'm based in the southwest, based in Bristol, and look forward to meeting any uh, past, present, or future clients during the course of the day. Now, any questions? I'll do my best to answer. We certainly have uh, a lot more experience in the company that can answer questions for you. Y yeah, because that might be a classical mistake. This, you may think you will only listen to us today. No, it's wrong. There is this part that will start now. It's called everything you always wanted to know about vacant property management, but were afraid to ask. <laughs> So um, that comes from a famous Monty Python film, one of the good export products of the UK that came to Holland. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hear your cases, your problems with vacant property in this part. We brought a lot of specialists here uh, from Make Space Pay, from Facility Management. So please, uh, my colleagues Kerry and Stephen will bring you a microphone. Uh, it's over there. Uh, we'll hand you the mic, and if you are willing to share your question with us, uh, I kindly invite you to do so now, so we can probably have some uh, discussion on all the issues that uh, Tim raised here. Any first volunteers? Any hands rising? He can't be that good. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned something about civil proceedings as opposed to criminal. Yes. Is that changing? I heard something about something going through the, the Houses of Parliament. Paul? Squ the squatting laws. Yes, I'm going to pass over to Paul. Paul Costner. Um, no? <laughs> yeah, the, the laws are changing. And, uh, could, you, could you please stand up, Paul? Paul Costner, he's a regional manager for the Midlands. Yeah, you're quite right. The laws are changing. So uh, squatting... Uh, as a protection for us against that, uh, the law or the rights, is no longer what it was. But the solution obviously still protects against squatters who ignore the law anyway uh, and do the vandalism and damage before somebody comes along and says, well, actually, you shouldn't be here because it's against the law now. Um, it still doesn't stop the actual occupation of squatters. But you're quite right, it, it, it's in the process of change. This is Mr. Tony Brennan, our regional manager from the north. W one of the problems... Um that this solution by the government is going to cause is that they're only going to make um, squatting residential properties illegal. And what that will mean, the squatters will decide, well, we'll have to move to a commercial property then. So I think that's going to actually cause more problems for you know, the commercial owners. That's absolutely true. Um, gentlemen. Sorry. Can I just put... Um another perspective on the squatting issue. My name's Simon Ledbeater. I work for Providence Row. Uh, we work with homeless people. And one of the, another dimension to the squatting issue is that a lot of our clients are actually homeless. They live in squats and they travel to us to try and find work and uh, gain independence. So on the one hand, I have every sympathy with the issues of squatting. On the other hand, a knock-on effect is it's going to probably lead to more rough sleeping as well. So it's just another dimension which perhaps you should mm. consider. Orbit, I accept some of the justification there for it. Well, maybe it's good to share some, some cases from the Netherlands because in the squatting law we are two years ahead of the UK then. Um, squatting became a criminal offence in 2010 and the law is 26 pages and the first sentence is squatting is a criminal offence. But then the other 26 pages uh, actually write for those governments and councils and all those that they need to play an active role in vacant property management within their community. And it provides them with a lot of tools. And the vacant property companies like Camelot are mentioned in the law as a good solution to find, uh, both from the perspective from those people that are looking for a place to work or sleep and uh, the, the viewpoint from the owner, to, to come up with solutions. And we'll present you some cases today where we can bring that together. So actually your business in Holland rose... Uh, although the law uh, made squatting illegal, but the 26 pages where the councils had, were forced to play an active role in vacant property management made our business grow instantly. And uh, what we can see now is that, uh, that a good combination of a, a community, a council, a borough, or a government organization, a company like Camelot or alike, and the organizations like yours can together uh, put vacant buildings to use again. So, yeah. That's definitely, uh, that's definitely a good point. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a microphone. Uh, thank you. 
Um, I am aware of the benefits of the guardianship thing, and I know a bit about having been here before and read all your um, leaflets in the past. But it's not 24-hour security, and my understanding is that obviously people do go out to work during the day. Yes, they do. They're mainly key workers. They're not unemployed people. No, they're not. So is there not a risk that when somebody goes out the door at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock, and the building's empty during the day that the gypsies are going to come in and nick the lead. The most important thing is that property is occupied. Like I say, you're my property today. I'm at work, my wife's at work, the lad's at school. It's still an occupied property. So, yes, I mean, certainly we, we do take workers night, day shift. There's people that work from home as well. Um, so, yes, there are times when the property is empty. The most important thing is that property is occupied. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is the microphone coming around? Interesting. Yeah, I've got a question about uh, development control. We're using a, a commercial building for residential use. Do you have issues on that? No, I'm sorry, uh, sorry I, missed, I missed the question. Sorry, sorry yeah, I'll repeat the question. Um, do you get issues from development control of local councils for change of use? So far, no. I've got a specialist here. <laughs> Yeah, we have um, a number of barristers' opinions, which if you want, we can send them to you um, based on that very question. Um, essentially, the, the law, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but in essence, we're considered ancillary to the use of the building because we're a security solution rather than a change of use for residential planning. Uh, but we have got a whole load of legal bump, which will answer the question. And most of the authorities and councils we work with accept it as that. Hi there. Uh, just, just following up from the gentleman's question, um, there are some companies that add a security system, like an alarm system. I mean, is that something you do as well? We are a security company as well, so we can provide you with alarms. And for some larger buildings, it's more it's a, a solution that is not just living guardians because the complex is great. Example, given this former shed headquarters, it's three, three large buildings on a huge site. And we might need 50 living guardians to protect every part of it. So there's a combination there of fences, alarm systems. Um, we even had dog guards after the eviction for a couple of weeks and living guardians. So it's a combined solution there. So it depends definitely on the building, the options of the building. Can we put it to use uh, on, on, on strategic points so that, that lights are uh, burning at night on, on strategic points in the building? And if needed, we can also provide you with alarm systems. So it can be a mixed solution. It's a full range of traditional security. If the property needs boarding up, side texting through to alarms, be it a, a Dalek alarm that runs off a battery through to a, a full wire for a... Um, alarm, yes, certainly it's something we, we do do. But the majority of projects can be handled with living guardians yes. like that. And so you can save on all the alarm costs. Okay, so gentlemen about there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all back row. <laughs> if you've got a, uh, a large commercial building, you've put your guardians in there. How do you get around HMO issues? I'm sorry, how do I? HMO issues, have you come across that? Yes, let's give it to Paul again. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we do fit to HMO standard. I'm not sure, is it yourself? Sorry. We do fit to HMO standard and we work with the fire brigades in each region to make sure that we're fitting to HMO fire brigade standard as well. Uh, if it's a local authority, obviously they don't have to apply for the license themselves generally, um, so there's no issue there. Um, if it is insistent that we do have to look at HMO licensing, then we do, but most of... Uh, Sensible councils appreciate with a, a security solution. We're fitted to HMO standards so that they have the same facilities, but we then don't have to apply through the license uh, okay. proposal. But if it's insistent and it's profitable for us, then we will do so. And is that that's funded by a camera or is that the owner's cost? Um, to the fit out to the standard? Yeah, it right. depends on the project because if it's a large project, project and we can put quite a few guardians in, yeah. uh, there's obviously a, a dual income stream for us. Sure. If, the client pays us a small amount, the guardian pays us a small amount, we're happy, it's a win-win. If we've got a big project and we can put quite a number of guardians in, then obviously we can afford to put more facilities in. So sure. depending on the project, we, we'd negotiate the cost. Okay. Why don't you just stay with me here because it's all the technical stuff yeah. and laws and uh, I'm from Holland, but you, I'll bore yeah. you to death with all those Dutch uh, stuff. It's not you're answering your questions. Good questions so far. Um, to us, of course, it's business as usual. It's, uh, the, the solution came up in the Netherlands. So just to give you a broad idea, in the 1980s, we had 50,000 squatters in the Netherlands, specifically in the Amsterdam area. Today, 2012, with 
not just Camelot. There is 50 offers in the Holland, uh, of which 18 apply to the government quality marks. Uh, we house over 50,000 people in the Netherlands into vacant buildings today, and the squatting movement has been reduced to um, from 2,500 buildings in 2010 in the Amsterdam area alone to 130 today. So the Amsterdam government, together with companies like Camelot, has reduced the number of unused, finalized buildings back to in two years' time. So um, it really is proven, a, a proven concept. And the majority of people that squat don't do that out of, like, anarchistic or political ideas. They do it because they are in need of a good and cheap mm. housing. And so we come up with solutions like that. The, the story I'd love to tell here in London is always the Westminster City Council that could not find key workers like nurses and teachers and firemen and policemen because they could not afford the rates that were charged in the, in the London City area to live. And we came up with a solution together with that council to provide key workers uh, homes that, in buildings that were owned by the local council. So it's a win-win situation for all, and that's, that's uh, what our business is all about. Uh, we, we call ourselves the vacant property specialist, and our idea is always to come up with a solution to put a building to use. So I really appreci appreciate all your questions. I can imagine there are more. It's always the back rows that put up their fingers, but uh, maybe someone else else. Yeah, the lady over there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for helping me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know if there's sort of a minimum standard of building, because surely these people need showers and yep. a kitchen. And Very good question. And I'm thinking some of our buildings haven't got anything. Just haven't done, they haven't got no. electric, they haven't got the water turned on. Well, we came to buildings probably far less uh, in, in condition than yours, and what we do, we provide uh, temporary uh, showers, kitchens, and we put them in. For example, remove one toilet, put a shower unit in there. It's these things you might know from the Formula One hotels in France, which is a, a, a toolkit you just put in, and then there's a kitchen or a shower unit. And we take it out when you give us your three weeks' notice, put back the toilet, and you won't see anything of it. So we can make a building uh, fit for living uh, instantly, 48 hours. Right, but we'd have to sort of get the services connected, like the electricity and the, the gas. The Shell building you've just seen, there was no electricity, no water. We had to restore it, everything else. And we, it took us 20 people for three weeks in four days. We restored electricity, we restored water, we cleaned it, we uh, fixed it, and then now we put it to use as work and, and living space. So we've handled the problem, and, and, and the thing is, almost every building, it, we, the only thing we ask from you is, is it wind and water tight? And if so, we are able to, uh, to put it to use. Even if it's not, Bob, I've got a project on the South Coast, which is a ministry, an old Ministry of Defence site, which has been um, vandalised over many years, and we've got two mo uh, mobile homes on site, two guardians who live there, and uh, so we actually bring mobile homes in. And that's an easy matter then. To, uh, you know, they've got a joint generator between them. So there are ways of looking outside the box to see how can we, we can get occupation. It's not necessarily in the buildings, but it's on site. There are certain ways around most of the problems. If not, we think hard and we find them. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, so far, it's still the, um, yeah, the, the basic questions on our Living Guardians concept, and all, but there's, I'm, I'm sure there's way more experienced uh, people here in the room that know the concept and have way more complicated questions as well. Please, please feel free to ask us. Yeah, gentlemen. Yeah, I've just got a question on uh, the fire safety order, actually. Um, the responsible person would usually be the owner of the property, um, and if it was a property in multiple occupation, you'd have a managing agent who'd be the responsible person. Do you become the managing agent? Uh, and therefore you're the responsible person under the FSO. Mr. Del Suku is a facility management specialist. One second. The reform order actually puts the responsibility on the manager of the premises, which will be ourselves. It's us. Yeah, we do the fire risk assessment. We take charge of that. Um, very often in terms of the maintenance, there's a discussion between ourselves and the property owner because there's an insurance risk, obviously, as much as the fire safety orders, the, the, the regulations... The insurers usually want more in that regard. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, do you, as Camelot, have insurance yourself so that if you're called in to look after a building and a problem then arises, would you seek to redress the owner of the building or would you refer the matter to your own insurers? 
Well, yeah, that's of course. Um, currently, we are managing over uh, 5,000 projects uh, all over Europe, and what we do have is a specific policy that has been written for us by Mars Insurance, and we've put that policy on the market, and it covers a full portfolio over Europe. Buildings coming in, buildings getting out. It covers the liability of the employees and the guardians going in and out of your building. So we have taken care of it. We, we, we pay a, a huge amount per year for the policy, I can assure you. And, of course, we have all the other liable insurances like employee liability and all that kind of stuff. Of course, yes, we are, we, we are checked by both ISO and SIA, and it's all the required stuff. But just in case, we call it the... the uh, in the Dutch, we call it uh, the, how do you call it, the net, where the, the artists, when they tumble in the circus, they fall in. That net, we pay a huge amount on insurance premiums to cover our full portfolio for all the risks that are not covered in anything else. That's the most easy way. I'm not an insurance specialist, but that's the most easy way to explain mm. it to you. So, yes, as a company, um, uh, every year our portfolio has been, it will be checked by, uh, by the insurer, the, the, the one that uh, asks the premium. The premium will be, uh, yeah, will be measured for that. So, yes, I can say yes. And if you want, we can show you all the paperwork that comes with it to uh, reassure your uh, finance or administrative departments. Cool. Thank you. Um, a lot of older commercial properties are riddled with asbestos. Do you do your own sort of independent assessment of asbestos content before? I think that's all for Daryl. <laughs> We would work together with the owner, obviously, in terms of asbestos, um, your surveys. If you need us to do the surveys, we can. Um, but in terms of the maintenance, obviously, we're going to rely on the initial surveys, but we, we'd manage it together. Um, my understanding, and somebody can correct me, is that um, in, in terms of asbestos, there, there's no actual requirement if it's a landlord or it's a manager. It seems to put it a bit in the air, actually, who's responsible. It just puts a, a requirement to have the system in place and somebody to be managing it. Um, so we work together in that regard. Um, we have had some experience um, in terms of um, asbestos, um, with the larger council blocks and things like that, um, vandalism going on at the same time as we were going in. Um, so we've got experience, but I, th I think asbestos is this unknown, scary thing that sort of pops up when it comes to a building all the time where everybody's just a bit unsure of the, the litigation down the line. I think just to add to that also, from um, a placing of our guardian's point of view, I'm not sure who asked the question, if, if we could um, have sight of an asbestos register initially, then we can make safe zones. Uh, the same with any kind of, uh, of dilapidation on a building. If there's no roof on part of the building, well, we'll make that a safe zone, a no-go area, but place our guardians in other parts. So we can have sight of the register. We build it into our uh, health uh, and safety risk assessment. And we do that free of charge for you, as well as the fire risk assessment. We do that free of charge as part of the service. But we'll just make sure that the guardian is in a safe zone. Um, and if we don't know where the asbestos is or the register, then we can talk to you about uh, obtaining one, or Daryl can set one up with you. A property I've just taken over in Bristol has had a flat roof problem. It's an old care home where both sides you've got pitched roofs. In the middle, there's the span. It was a modern, a, a later extension or uh, to span the gap and the flat roof has failed in all the rains a couple of months ago. You've now got uh, blackened rooms and lots of spores. So very quickly, as soon as they started to form, we've got the guardians out of that area into one area. We've now chained the doors, and that middle area now is a no-go area. And we've reinstalled showers and toilets. And there's a sluice room that's now a, a nice shower room, reinstated toilets, so they're now in the safe zone. So we're certainly not taking risks with our guardians, certainly not taking risks with, uh, with ourselves or, or your properties. Um, so far, we seem to have talked about um, buildings that are entirely vacant. Are you able to offer solutions where there may be four or five floors of occupied commercial premises with one entirely empty floor? Definitely, yes. We, yeah. um, of course, the majority of buildings, it's, n it's never 100% yeah, vacant or 100% occupied. There's a lot of in-betweens. Uh, maybe just another example from Holland, of course, where my home base is. We call it workspace. It will come up later on as well. We've... Yeah, I know. I saw your badge. That's why I... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. up Workspace. It's a concept we, we um, just uh, introduced in the Netherlands. We've got these um, 
two, three, four, five-year-old office buildings, brand new, all facilities working, restaurant like this, uh, reception, uh, Wi-Fi, internet, top of the bill. But out of the 14 floors, four or five are unused. Uh, hard to find a tenant for that. You know, like everywhere else, uh, it, this one is uh, right across the street of Den De Hague City C Central Station. And it's owned by an insurance company as a, an investment. And we've got a deal that we got two floors and we make temporary rents for startup businesses and professionals like graphic designers or uh, single professionals, as we call them in Holland, and they can rent a desk for a month. And what we did, we did it for a couple of years with, in the former Ministry of Finance, also in The Hague, and after a year or so, we had 100 companies there. And it was 100 small, uh, single, two, three, four people businesses occupying a space where before that... Uh, the, the statistics, uh, uh, 4,000 uh, civil servants were working in the Ministry of Finance Statistics Department. Actually, this is the Ministry of Finance Statistics Department up, up here as well. Eh? That's, that's a coincidence. Mm. So um, the, um, the owner, um, uh, which was the government, sold the building, including the 100 users. And I went to a, a conference l l just recently where they said that the traditional way of working, that you go to an office from 9 to 5, that will, slide, will disappear and more and more people will work as individuals, uh, rent themselves out for projects, and that's a tendency that goes up. And also here in London, it's coming. So you don't need a fixed workspace. Huh? You need a flexible workspace where you can rent a desk for a month. Currently, today in Holland, we've got six buildings in six main cities where you can rent a desk for a month and sit there. And it's a new way of filling your vacant floors. And we fill the first one, and then we start with the second one. And we share the income. So we take all the management of the hands of the owner. Uh, we, uh, we, after the, the, our costs are out, uh, the income is, is went back to the insurance company. So it's a win-win situation. They don't have to find... You, you can't find these companies that bring in 2,000 people for your building. But we, we are a company with 100,000 people that visit our website every month to look for either work or live in live space. And uh, so we can, we can slowly fill it with one at a time. That's a new way of thinking how you can fill your business. This is just one case. But this is a very interesting thing, and it's really growing rapidly all over. So I'm really looking forward to hear your story as well, because I saw the workspace work on your batch. Maybe you are willing to share it with us now? What, what it's all about? Uh, <laughs> on the spot, um, like I was. It's, it's interesting <laughs> because actually you're kind of competing with what we do. <laughs> with this we might cooperate. We might cooperate. So um, we specialise in um, short, flexible leases for small, medium enterprises yeah. within London. And we own and manage our own buildings. We do have a couple of joint ventures where we've gone in with partners. But occasionally, we get spaces which are held by development plans or, um, for whatever reason, the market in that place is not quite right. I've got a particular problem with a property in Maidenhead at the moment, which has about 2,000 square feet of glorious space, but there's massive oversupply in that particular area. Yeah. Um, we're actually looking, and we are already doing, hot desking arrangements. We launched a new product called Club Workspace, which yeah. is quite high-end. Yeah based on a membership fee yeah. of a month. I, I, but that, that tends to be in our, our rather high-end five-star accommodation. Yeah. The, the premises that I have issues with are our three, two, and one-star accommodation. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're talking to a number of charities about doing something quite similar to this. So it would be... Rosemary. Met, yeah, think. yeah, Rosemary's here. Yeah, we've yeah, met. Yeah. You've met Rosemary yeah, already. Yeah, okay, we met yeah. at the... Um, yeah. Touching the Voids conference last year. Yeah. So um, it, that, that's quite interesting. So there might be some things that we can, yeah, we can talk about further. And that's exactly where it is. Um, um, we, 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 we are used to think the traditional way of companies that are in spaces or individuals. But there is a whole hybrid form there of people that are both either looking for the high end or we prefer that provide with the low end uh, solutions, yeah. flexible solutions. It can also be artists. For example, in that Shell headquarters we just saw, there is this gentleman and he restores, um, how do you call it? Um, uh, it's it's uh, where children <laughs> ride little horses and turn around. Roundabouts. Yes. He, he restores 100-year-old wooden roundabouts. And he needed, he had this project of a roundabout of 150 years old wood that needs to be the gold paint that needs to be restored. So he needed a space for six months, 500 square meters. 
And he said, I can't, you can't find that on the rental market or I pay the ridiculous money. And, and that kind of people that are willing to pay for six months of rent, finish the project and then are off. Uh, professionals, but there's a lot of graphic designers that want to work, uh, we as Camelot, we can offer them that they can work both in London or in Amsterdam or in Berlin within the Camelot solution, so they pay us a fee and they can use the workspaces we provide them with. So it's a whole new way of putting vacant office spaces particularly to use. And so the reason why we're in is because we've got this community already. We've got this community of over 10,000 Camelot guardians that the majority of them work or are an artist. Last year, I don't know who was here last year, we had this Guardian Art Show, and I was impressed with the quality of work that came in, you know, uh, on, on sculptures and paintings and everything, and those are just our guardians. So uh, we can provide you, you guys, the owners of the buildings, with a community that is willing to pay short-term rents and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's good There's you already met. There's an example close to the hand. In Birmingham, Paul's got a property under management, which is an old children's home. It's a detached property in a lovely part of town, big gardens, woodland behind. And when the children home, obviously there was, um, uh, there was no need for it, the council moved a team to work in downstairs. So they worked there during the day, as you would do in a normal office. Our guardian, uh, two guardians in that moment, Paul, one's a lawyer, one's a social worker. They come home 5, 5.30, and there's probably half an hour delay between the workers going and these chaps moving in. They share the kitchen. They share the lounge. There's even a snooker table. You know, it's all this sort of... So we can certainly have that sort of joint um, between the owner or the, um, the council or whoever it is working from the space. And then when our chaps come home, you've got the 24-hour protection bar, sort of half an hour in the morning, half an hour at night, with that sort of crossover time. So, yes, certainly a much simpler solution. Um, what's your experience with the uh, owners of the properties that you manage uh, using the, the time when they don't have tenants to uh, retrofit their property either for energy efficiency or for refurbishments? And is the property secure enough that those, measure, th those measures can be installed during that uh, time period? C certainly, if they're, if they're doing refurbishments, hopefully it's a refurbishment in part. Guardians can be moved into areas. For instance, house builders. We work with house builders. And it's called the Decant Program where the um, old social housing is emptied and then probably a couple of months later they get the planning through, it comes up on the development time scale and those houses are raised to the ground and they start the development. Now, in between the time that the old council tenants leave till the time it's ready to be pulled down, um, guardians move in and they're, they're constantly sort of shunted around the development as when they're needed, but it's a flexible solution for them as well. And if any property remains unsold or the... the um, social landlord, the RSL, has not taken over occupation, we can move the guardians into the brand new builds ready for occupation by the buyer or for the, um, the housing association. Any commercial properties? Uh, commercial properties, once again, a property in Bristol, which is in Portland Square, Bristol. They're going to start work at one end. Our guardians live in the listed part of the front. We've moved them from the office space at the back, cont cont contain them, but sort of move them into the bit of the front. Development will start water and electricity will uh, remain on their parts so they can obviously use the toilets, use the showers, use the kitchens. And then I, I think the plan is on that one. If no tenants are found, then they'll move to the refurbished offices at the back. So certainly every property is unique, and those sort of property problems, uh, well, not pr problems, they're, they're, they're things to overcome. They're, we work together very closely with the owners. We have a very good working relationship with the owners. At the end of the day, they're giving us their trust and their, their keys.